Hey, it's good to see you in church today. Amen. Hey, I want to give a big welcome to everyone here at Rhema Church physically. Those of you in Redemption Church watching us through the screen right now, can we give a huge hand to everybody in church today, online, wherever you are. And I get to see smiles. I get to see your faces. I am so excited about today. I'm so excited about the future, and I'm excited about what God is doing in our lives. And I believe that today, again, will be a word for you, and I cannot wait for you to hear what God would say to you today, because His Word is alive, His Word is relevant, His Word is our foundation, it is everything that we need. And as we gather under the name of Jesus, I just want you to know that you're in the right place. The, you're, in, you're in the best place you could be. I remember one person came to me and said to me, Pastor, uh, my life is, is going through such difficulty. How often should I be in church? You know what my answer was? Every service. Every time the doors open. Because it's the best thing you can do for yourself is to be in the house of God is to be around the people of God and hearing the word of God. It is the most productive thing you could ever have in your life. And it's not about just attending church. It's about being in the house of God. Yesterday, uh, Tara hosted the Gracious Daughters Gathering here in Rhema Church. Ladies, it was incredible, right? Um, and everything that was planned in the natural, the production, the presentation, the fantastic experience was impossible because there was zero electricity, right? The power grid of the country was off. The generator was failing. Everything was wrong. But God moved. They had a three-hour service in the dark, and so many people were delivered and set free, right? There is no better place to be than in the house of God. Redemption, you're in the right place. Rhema, you're in the right place. Those of you watching around the world, being in the house of God, and I'm not talking about just physically, but engaging with and allowing what's happening here to be what your eyes and your ears are fixated on. It's the best thing you can do. It's better than any spa. It's better than any gym. It's better than any leadership summit, right? Because the Word of God speaks supernaturally to a natural circumstance. You're not here for a natural solution. We can give you natural, listen, life skills are fantastic, but the living Word, in my opinion, has a higher power. And I'm not coming against telling people good wisdom. That's awesome. That's awesome. But be hungry for the Word of God to speak supernaturally to your situation. So often people will say to me, Pastor, when you said this, my whole world changed. I took, that, I took that statement that I heard you say, it fed me, it gave me an, a revelation, and I applied it, and my life has never been the same. And I say to them, I never said that. When I was preaching, you heard the Holy Spirit interpret what I was saying in a relevant way to you. And, and so often, under the Word of God, you hear things God is saying to you. I'm just a vessel, right? And, and, and yes, I'm very grateful that we honor the gifts that serve the body of Christ. The men and women of God called to preach and teach, we honor that. But recognize we are just a vessel. We are a conduit, right? And under the Word of God, the Word will speak to you, right? In fact, Jesus understood the power of the Word because literally when the Roman soldier came to him and said to him, I have a servant who is sick. I recognize your authority, right? Would you come and heal them? And Jesus, uh, no way, and Jesus said, do you want me to come and heal them? And the Roman soldier said, no, just at your word. And Jesus says, I haven't found faith like this anyway, right? But he just said, your word is enough. And the honest truth is in your life, the word should do all the work. So when you wake up in the morning, and now we've just launched the Rhema app. There's a Rhema app that you can get all the sermons for free. So when you're around Wi-Fi, you just download them, keep them in your phone. You can watch them. You know, 
Uh, we have the same at Redemption Church, but we always want to give away the word for free. Tara and myself, we've always done our best to make everything we preach be available for free. And when there was, when there was no uh, um, a digital way for you to do that, we, at Redemption, we used to print the, the, the CDs and we gave away, th- I think at one stage it was like four or 5,000 CDs a month. But the word is what we believe changes your life. And, and so when we gather and when you listen and when you hear a good sermon, don't just listen once, listen again and again. And also when, when the Lord stirs something in you, share it with someone else. You know, so now even within apps and with YouTube and that, you can just hit copy the link and send it to someone and let it feed them because it's really, it's the foundation to move in the supernatural. And the supernatural is incredible. The supernatural is far better than the natural, right? Someone works their whole life for something, they sweat, they toil, they strive in the natural, and maybe it'll happen in the supernatural. Jesus, he toils, he strived, he sweated, he died. And people look at your life and they say, it's not killing you to build a great life. It's not killing you to thrive, right? It should cost you your marriage. It should cost you your health. And you say, yes, it's super natural. It's, it's the life that we are to walk in. And it's when we face trials that we need to even be aware. There is a natural circumstance that you face, but there is a supernatural answer. Amen. Today, I want to get straight into it. I want to speak to you about the missing piece. I don't know about you, but people are running around looking for something to complete them, someone to complete them. Something to give them purpose. I don't know about you, but if I said to you in this moment right now, Pastor Josh, if I said to myself, Josh, what do you need? I could name a hundred things right now that I need, right? I need, I need air conditioning and heating in this building. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And we believe soon, amen. But the point being, like there's natural needs around my life. If only I could have this, if I could have that. Lord, if my metabolism was quicker, if my hair grew better. Well, my, my problem is not that my hair grows, it's where it grows. <laughs> the strangest thing happened. It stopped growing here and it started growing here. <laughs> right? This, I haven't cut this because it's freezing. This is, my, this is my barrier for the cold weather in winter in Johannesburg. All right, this is my fleece. Okay, Tara's gonna freak out. I never planned to do that, all right? (laughs) Got real, all right? But the point is, there's things that we all need. But even beyond that, maybe something has been taken from your life in the last little while. Maybe someone has been taken from your life on this earth. Maybe a relationship has been destroyed. Maybe a marriage. Maybe you've even lost loved ones who've died in the last few years. And there is a brokenness. There is something missing. And the truth is God designed you with a hole in your soul. He made you in need of something. That is why the whole world is searching, searching and searching. That is why no matter how wealthy people are, they are still impoverished. You will find that very poor people tend to have a lot of things sometimes. You'll see a person walking the earth and they have a lot of stuff, but they lack so much, right? If money and fame and success gave you ultimate uh, peace and rest, you would find that people would stop having destructive behaviors once they had achieved their goals, right? They would discover that, wow, I've achieved something and now I'm good. I've met someone, come on now, I like you. You're like single and you're like, if I can just meet someone, right? If I can just meet someone, they'll change everything. That'll, and maybe you're sitting and you're like, you know, if I can just have that promotion, if I can just have that parking space, if I can just have that salary, if I can just win the lottery, right? If I can just take that chance, right? It'll change everything. Yet when you go and do research, you will find people that have won lotteries, right? The overwhelming majority say it destroyed their life, destroyed their homes, destroyed their relationships, 
right? You'll talk to people who are the richest people in the world, married four times, five times, 10 times. Now, even if you listen, there are, there are very educated, smart people who are on a pursuit for an external awareness, for a spiritual enlightenment. So they will do things like walk on coals, on burning their feet. They will go in and, 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 and drink this stuff called ayahuasca juice in the jungle and trip for 20 hours and go through all these trips. They will eat magic mushrooms. They will smoke all kinds of drugs. They will mix all kinds of chemicals because they are in the pursuit of something greater than what they have everywhere. And even in your life right now, can I tell you, there's two dashboards in your mind. There are two dashboards in, in your thinking, in your, in your inner thinking, even in, in your heart and your hopes and your desires. And there, there is a dashboard that has all the things that you're grateful for. But that's off. That's got no lights. That's got no sound. And there's another dashboard. All the things that have gone wrong, all the things that you want to go right, all the stuff that you're, you're desiring, right? That something, that person, that promotion, that financial breakthrough, that dashboard has neon lights. It's an LED dashboard. It has a repeating, revolving speaker with a major Paramount movie trailer voice in an American language going, you know what I mean, coming soon. If only I could just. This dashboard is the only one you even pay attention to, right? It's telling you what's missing, what's broken, what you're needing, what you want. And God made us in the pursuit of something. Now, it's literally a missing piece, like a piece of a puzzle, but actually it is a missing piece, like peace that only God can give you right? And right now on the earth, one thing that is missing beyond all things is peace. People have no peace, right? People have no peace. They have no rest. They have no security. And no one knows who to trust. No one knows who to believe. No one knows what to do. Six months ago, it was, I'm investing in coins, bitcoins, dodge coins, that coin, right? And everyone who did that six months ago is going, pastor, pastor, could you not have told us, right? Could you not have said something, coins, what's going on with coins? But they were not after coins. Most of you don't even understand it, 99.9%. I have no idea what's going on. I plug on a computer, I go through a bunch of ones and zeros, I come out with something that doesn't exist physically, and I sell it to you for a squillion rand. How do I know I have it? Well, this app tells you, right? Look, the reason they're chasing this is because they want financial security, because they have a belief on this earth that money solves problems. And can I tell you something? Go ask the richest people in the world if it solved problems. Ask their wives. <laughs> ask their children's. <laughs> ask their husbands. Right? Did it bring peace? No, it just exposed the brokenness that was already there. They just got more messed up. Now they could just get around with it. Now they were, they were not watching pornography. They were making pornography in their rooms. Do you get what I'm trying to say? And... and it's even not, not the pursuit of these things. It's the fact that there is not enough of something in us that drives us to pursue something, okay? And so when we look at this, we recognize the world's looking for something. The world's looking for something. And, and, and the truth is they're not finding it. Because when you find something, you stop looking. I don't know if that's a bit very deep this morning, all right? When you find something, you found it, don't need it anymore, right? So God understood that, and that is literally his ultimate ministry, is to give us perfect peace. It was prophesied over Jesus, and it was fulfilled in his coming, and it is protected and sustained by the Holy Spirit. So there is a 
promising by the Father, the coming by the Son, right? And the continuance by the Spirit. And this is what the world calls it or recognize that when they see it amongst you, and there's many different ways to talk about it in Scripture, but ultimately, everyone has this missing piece. And it's not fulfilled by who you marry. It's not fulfilled by how much money you have. It's not fulfilled by how strong you feel, what possessions you have, how liked or unliked you are. It is only fulfilled through the ministry of Jesus Christ. Okay? So in John chapter 14, verses 26 through 27, it tells us, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, this is Jesus speaking, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I said to you. So we recently had a Pentecost Sunday. We celebrated the giving of the Holy Spirit, but the, the Holy Spirit is being given to us right, to do certain things, and he brings to remembrance the work of Jesus to us, right, what Jesus means to us, how that impacts us. As a believer today, the Holy Spirit comes alongside you, and he sees what you face, right, and then what he does is he then affirms the word of God over what you face, so the Holy Spirit will come to you today and say to you, this pastor is speaking to you because you know you're very worried about that bill. You've been sleeping, you've been drinking, you've been up all night, you've been trying your best to get rid of this possible liquidation, sequestration, or whatever you're facing, right? But the Holy Spirit will come alongside you and then start to show you what the Word of God says over you through Christ Jesus in relation to that situation, okay? So he speaks but the Holy Spirit never speaks in contradiction to the Word of God, nor the work of God, right? So when the Bible says the Holy Spirit comes, right, to convict three truths, to reveal and expose three truths, the world of their sin. So when people, so what are we? We are the bride, we are the church, not the world. People who do not believe in Jesus, people who are watching right now, you have yet to declare Jesus your Lord and Savior. What the Holy Spirit will do through the sermon is say, you want Jesus as your Lord and Savior because you're living in a life of brokenness and defeat, right? The root of that is you are a sinner because you're not able to save yourself. You were born a sinner. You were born with this sinful flesh, right? You need Jesus to wash you, forgive you, redeem you, and declare you a new creation for eternity. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Of the world, he convicts them of sin, letting them know you're stuck in this sin, right? Not you are bad, but you are in a bad place. You need a savior, right? But then when he comes alongside the believer, right? Can I tell you something? You already know the sin that you're committing. You already know what you're doing wrong, right? You have that inner moral spiritual witness, but the Holy Spirit will come along saying to you, that's not where you have to remain. He convicts you by scripture of your righteousness. But who are you in Jesus Christ? Who are you by the blood of the lamb? Who are you by the broken body? Who are you by his perfect work? Right, not that you stay in brokenness, but that you are brought out of brokenness. And it's the righteousness of God that you can't work for, but you are receiving as a gift by Jesus. And how does the Holy Spirit do that? He speaks to you about the word of God, right? Right? So, and whenever you hear something that seems to conflict with scripture, right? Right? That seems to contradict the work of Jesus, right? Recognize that's not the Holy Spirit, right? And that's why the devil's called the accuser. He brings accusation. Oh, but if you're really a child of God, what about this? Right? What did the devil came? If you're the son of God, turn this bread, turn this stone into bread. If you're the son of God, Jesus, accusation, prove to me you are who you say you are. What does Jesus say? I don't live by bread alone, but by every word. Now, what word is he speaking about? The word that came out of heaven. He used the word, the literal word, not Torah, not, not scripture. He said to the devil, I live by the words audibly spoken to me by God. There's only one place that happens. When Jesus is baptized, 
God speaks. And he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus says to the devil, you come with, if you're the son, God said, I'm the most loved son. And before I do one miracle, he already declares me pleasing. So the devil removes two truths when he questions your identity. The first one is that you're loved by God. Why? Because if he says, if you're the most loved by God's son, yeah, exactly. Thanks for reminding me. I don't need to prove anything to you. Right? Right? He says, if you're the son of God, then prove it. Meaning, try to do it in your own ability. Do it in your own strength. Earning the title son. And Jesus says, I was already the most pleasing son before I did anything. Right? So when you need to overcome temptation, you need to recognize the devil is trying to get you to do something that Jesus has already done to be something that you already are. All right? So this is the Holy Spirit's ministry. You can feel him. Like right now, some of you are getting it. Like, wow. See, he confirms that word. You know when the Holy Spirit fell in, in, in Acts chapter 10 and the whole house is filled with tongues? Do you notice that there's no salvation prayer? There's no pause, repeat after me. Because what happened was, if you read it, it said, upon these words, the Holy Spirit fell. Upon these words. The words just before that Peter, Peter was preaching, you're forgiven of your sin. Everyone who believes in Christ Jesus. And as he says that, what happened? They believed. And as they believed, they were filled, right? Peter didn't understand this. He goes back, and the leaders of the temple are like, what have you done? You've ruined everything. You gave the Gentiles the Holy Spirit. How can the Spirit be in an unclean vessel, right? But the truth of the matter is the Holy Spirit always moves on the back of God's word according to who you are in Christ. That's why there's an anointing right now, because I'm not telling you who you are by your own strength and your own work. I'm telling you who you are because of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit says, yes, I'll partner with that. I'll move on the back of that, right? So the Holy Spirit is given the role, right, to point us to the work of Jesus, to bring to remembrance who you are in Christ, to affirm in you what Jesus has done for you, what he's doing for you. Then in verse 27, Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Right, so Jesus there, he's not saying I'm gonna leave you peace, like, you know, have a bit of peace. The language there is when I die, you will inherit the peace I possess. He says, I leave it to you, and the language there is through the will. I love the language. Through the will of the Father. On the other side of my death, it is my will. You know, we look to the will. What does the will say? How much money are we gonna get? What does the will say? What does the will of the Father say? The peace that Jesus walks with, we inherit through his death, okay? And he says, now this is interesting, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now here's the thing, we are living in a day where fear is at its highest point. We have many things to be afraid of, okay? Many things, all right? I don't know what country, language you're, 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 you're watching in. I don't know what your circumstance is, but there are many things you are afraid of. You fear happening, okay? Let's just be straightforward. We've just come out of this virus, right? People are fearful of getting sick, right? People are fearful of being unprovided for, fearful, right? But the Bible says it doesn't begin with fear. The root is your heart. And it says if your heart gets troubled, you will become afraid. So now we get to the deeper root. The fruit is fear, but the root is a troubled heart. I don't know about you, but often I will just have this inner sense that something's off, that something's wrong. And I can't explain it, but scripture's better at it. It says, 
my heart feels troubled, right? There's something off. There's something unsettling, right? And from a troubled heart, you start to manifest fear and anxiety, okay? Now, the heart is very interesting because the heart is something on the earth that can be swayed. It can be swayed by the spirit nor the flesh. It, 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 it can move. So your heart is not in this earth, in this body right now, set on spiritual realities alone. Your spirit is, but your heart is influenced, right? So like for those of you who are big football fans, you will hear that the soccer season kicks off in a couple of months, and already as a Man United fan, my heart gets troubled. Because <laughs> I realize I have to go through another season of this, okay? Potential deep disappointment and devastation. But your heart is triggered, right? And the truth is, your heart can be triggered by the world, or your heart can be triggered by the word through the Holy Spirit. So either your heart is given to what could happen negatively, incorrectly, deep fears, deep troubles, deep issues, or your heart can be triggered by the faithfulness, the promises, the scripture, the revelation, and the Holy Spirit saying to you, but hang on a second, but hang on a second. This is what the word of God says. This is who Jesus is. This is how you walk, right? In Proverbs chapter 14, verses 30, it says, A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. That word there for a sound heart is literally in Hebrew, marpe, and its root word is actually healing, right? But the root word of healing in Hebrew is actually relax, to be at rest. So the Bible says when your heart is whole, it is relaxed, right? Relaxed, troubled. Relaxed, troubled, right? And the missing piece, right? The fruit of the peace of God is being relaxed, whole, strong. Now, Jesus goes through life like us. And I'm gonna be honest with you, way worse than you and I. We, we like, oh, I want to, I want to, <laughs> I want to be like Christ. You've got to be very careful when you, how you look at that. All right, because the God of the earth walked this earth and the devil did everything he could to come against him. All right, you might be persecuted, but you're not persecuted like Jesus is persecuted. You might be troubled, but you're not troubled in, by natural things like Jesus was. Like the devil shows up to him comes against him. They try to kill him many times, and ultimately that would need to take place to fulfill Scripture. But, but Christ walked through way worse than you and I. Way, way worse. In fact, what's so amazing is, you know, when the storm rose and Jesus is sleeping, we often get a picture when we see that animated, like there's a wooden boat and there's this inner kind of chamber, you know, and it rocks, but it's dry, and there's, there's always a candle, and I'm the guy going, but this is a wooden boat. <laughs> Do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, I don't get that thing, but we always see him lying there, and he's being swayed, and there's a candle, and on the outside, the, the, the disciples are like, and water, get Jesus, we're gonna die. You know how the storms you see, you know what I mean? It's like, hold on, huge waves, but Jesus is sleeping down in this little chamber of dry, warm you know, relaxation. That's not true at all. The boats that they were on had no such thing. The fishing boat used in the time did not have inner chambers. It was one fishing boat. And literally the language there is he was not sleeping in the hole, meaning under, underground. He was sleeping at the helm. The helm is where the captain sits, right by the waves, right, can see, oh my goodness, here comes the biggest wave possible, can look, lightning, lightning, storms, winds, waves. I love watching the show called Deadliest Catch about these crab fishermen. Tara doesn't understand it. No, I just, 
I don't know why, I love it. And they go out and they've got to catch these things and something always goes wrong and someone always gets hurt. It feels like running a church, hallelujah, okay? <laughs> but I'm just like, I get it, right? And, and the captains are awake at night and they're panicking and they're like, if we can't catch the crab, we can't pay our bills. If, I, if this wave hits, people can die. There's something that can go wrong at all times, right? And Jesus is not sleeping Apart from the storm, he is sleeping in the greatest position of the awareness of the storm. He is sleeping with waves crashing on him, with lightning striking near him, with wind blaring, and he's fast asleep. Now, let me tell you, the disciples standing, I can tell you right now, I'm the guy that goes, I can't even sleep in a nice bed when I'm stressed, when I'm anxious. You know, I, 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 I even find myself sleep is hard at the moment. Sleep is light. Sleep is, you know what I'm trying to say? Uh, even me, it, the only time I am asleep is when I'm in a deep sleep and then I get hit by terror. What's that noise? What's that sound? Right? And I have to go downstairs in my underwear and I don't know what I'm going to do if someone's in our house. I mean, I'm in my underwear. Do you know what I'm trying to say? But we're always on edge. Jesus is fast asleep at the helm. I mean, that, 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 that'll testify to you. He's fast asleep in control. Not because that circumstances are in control. Because he's at the helm. And people look at your life and they go, how can you relax with all this going on? You say, Jesus is in control. People say to me, how can you, how are you gonna pastor two churches, different languages, different countries, different, I don't know. But it's Jesus' responsibility. How are we gonna pay the bills? How are we gonna do what we gotta do? How are we gonna reach people? But he's fast asleep now. That's the peace. He's telling the disciples, when I die for your sin and I raise again, from the dead, that's yours. That's yours, right? That's yours. It's the revelation that he was at peace when the circumstances were the worst they could ever be. The worst, and you know what's so cool? I was reading, (laughs) I was reading Isaiah chapter nine, verses six, and it gave me a chuckle. At the end, it literally tells us that Jesus is prophesied to be what? The Prince of Peace, right? But let's read the scripture together. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I I wanna tell you something. No government is gonna give you peace except his government. It it is, that's what I'm saying. If if we had a, if we had a family gathering online tonight, South Africans would have a chuckle about this because every time we got COVID regulations, it was called a family gathering. The attendance would be full to hear the news, but you have a gathering under the good news of God. People, because they haven't caught yet that what man and woman plan on earth is irrelevant to what he plans for you on earth, right? And it tells us that connected to him, being your prince of peace is recognizing he is governing. He is governing. Now, of course, we stand for the word of God, but it's irrespective of what the country tells me is right or wrong. When, what, if a man or a woman decides that's in contradiction to the word of God, it's not gonna rock my world. Like, I get it. Okay, fine, fair enough. Fair enough, you're in charge today and you say the sky's blue, sky's green, sky's, that's okay. I respect that, but I'm not gonna shift my world and my hope around that word, right? If, 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 if a president got up tomorrow and he said, run for your life, it's all over. The world is ending. I mean, we've all watched those movies, right? I'm gonna go to the word of God. Right, because I'm not alive and breathing today because a president ordained it, because a government decided it, right? I can tell you this, they were not there when this happened and that car accident and this. 
Do you hear what I'm trying to say? However you were raised, and whatever happened in your home, the abuse you went through, the issues you faced, the hurt you felt. But Jesus is the one who sticks with you, who stands with you, right? And I love the picture of when they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire because they were bound when they were thrown in the fire. And the fire was made as hot as it possibly could that everybody else around it died. But the Bible tells us there was a fourth man in the fire. But it also tells us when the fourth man appeared, Nebuchadnezzar saw four men free. So the fire did burn something. The bindings that was placed. And even though we're under economic pressure, we're under physical pressure, let that fire come close Lean on Jesus, and you know what comes out? On the other side, you realize, I'm not defined by whether there's a lot of money or little money. My peace is not defined by whether it's all going my way. You know, for some of you, if I had put in front of you what you would go through the last three years, you would say, I wouldn't live through that. I couldn't make it through that. I couldn't be alive today through that. If you told me on the other side of this, this would happen, that would happen, this would go wrong, this person would abandon, that person might die, you might get sick with this, you might lose that you would say, there's no ways I could make it through that. And yet here you are. Right? So it's that peace that he wants you to walk in and live in. But it's a peace connected to him. You will not get the peace of Jesus from God apart from getting it through him. You cannot get that peace because you get the promotion, because you marry that person, because you have a million followers on social media, because you immigrate, because you, it's, and I'm not coming against anybody with your plans, but make sure your plans are attached to the peace of God. Make sure your plans are attached to what he wants for your life, right? Nothing wrong with changing countries, changing jobs. Don't change spouses, okay, right? Right? Uh, Anyways. But it's not a judgment. I'm just saying, don't look to natural solutions that only supernatural things can change. Okay? And literally, marriage is where that comes really real. Right? And that's why it's a covenant God ordained. I find it highly entertaining that the world would want to try and do what only God ordains Because in order for you to do what God calls you to do, you have to do it through him. So if you say, I don't believe in God, but I'm going to try and fulfill a covenant where I'm going to serve and sacrifice and love someone supernaturally, you're crazy. In my opinion, it's like, why why, why would you do that, right? Uh, So it is where the rubber hits the road. But God wants to do that work in you and work through that situation. It says in Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3, right? This is speaking of God. You will keep him being us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because his trust is in you. See, being Christ conscious is not about being aware of what you need to do for Jesus. Because it says to be stayed on something means you have to place your trust in it. Right? So it's not, I'm gonna be a good Christian, now I'm going to, be a good Christian. I'm going to do all the things that are what a good Christian does. And that's how I will find peace. No, to be a believer in Jesus is to recognize I can do nothing that earns what Jesus came to earn for me. And when I trust in that work, right, I am at peace. So when I see Jesus hanging on the cross in my mind's eye, right, I see the suffering the Son of God went through for me. And I see, wow, Lord, I would so need that with my stress, with my anxiety, with my panic attacks, with all the things that go on in my life, how I need that. But I see that you've done that, you've provided that. Now I keep my eye on that. And I ask myself if Jesus has paid the price for it, for me, I can receive 
it. And so my mind being stayed on Jesus is not being stayed on trying to be religious. It is being focused on the truth, the ultimate truth that he paid. He paid it for me. He, he sacrificed for me. He fulfilled for me. It, it is him, right, who makes it all possible, not me. In Philippians chapter four, verses six through eight says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So our prayer is giving thanks for what God has done, right? Not, not, not giving thanks like God, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. Giving thanks like, Lord, you're faithful. Lord, you're good. Lord, you're kind, right? And what happens when we start to operate like that? We let our requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. What does it do? It guards your heart. So when your heart is starting to get troubled, right? We've got to recognize, Lord, I've got to bring this to you. I've got to bring it to you through Christ Jesus. Meaning, has Jesus taken care of this concern? See, the devil will always come back to you because the moment he points you to Jesus, he loses. So he always come back to you, but you are unhealthy, but you have hereditary disease, but you have had depression for a long time, but you cannot make relationships work, but you, you destroy everything that's good and you are self-destructive, but you, you have, you, 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 you're, you're, you're weak, you have no courage, no one loves you, to you. But the Bible says, right, but point yourself to him, right, looking unto him right? Looking at Him, fixating on Him. Now, what's interesting is the Holy Spirit actually does this with us. In fact, it tells us when we don't know what to pray, pray in the Spirit. Because when we pray in the Spirit, we pray according to the revelation of heaven. Now, we know that the Holy Spirit we heard today is literally here to bring to remembrance to us and our situation, right? What we're going through. So even sometimes I believe when we pray by the Spirit, we recognize we don't even realize what we're praying into, what we're praying over, what we're dealing with, right? And so when we come to God, this is what it's like. And what is the result? Peace, rest. And we see pictures of this all over the Old Testament. Even when Moses is in the desert and they're getting, they're getting bitten by snakes and they're dying of sickness, God says, hey, make a bronze snake on a stick. Raise it up, and everyone who looks in that direction. And why? Because cursed is all who hang, right, on the cross. And he was made a curse for us. And it's literally a bronze idol that was raised. Uh, not an idol, a bronze representation of what would become what Jesus would fulfill. The cursed one hanging on a stick. And bronze is always the medal of judgment. So God's like Moses make a picture of Jesus' judgment, for the people to look to in faith. And he tells them, anyone who gets bitten, just look at it, right? And you say, how's that relevant today? Do you know there were over 4 million Jews traveling at the time? Only about 10, 20,000 could have seen the stick with their eyes, literally, right? And the closer you are to human population, the less snakes hang around. So it's the ones on the outskirts in the wilderness that would have been going out in their lives and trying to harvest and trying to find... They were getting bitten, and they were just told, look in the direction of the stick, right? It's a picture of faith. Do you see Jesus hanging there, cursed? And you know, that's the symbol for medicine, the snake on the stick, by the way, right, from then. But it's always about seeing Jesus who fulfills it for you. Oh, man, I never even got to this, right? <laughs> so when Jesus shows up in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 20, the disciples are gathered in fear because their hearts are troubled and he pitches up in the midst. Jesus always shows up in the midst of your mess. He doesn't hang out on the outside going, once you get that sorted out, then I'll come chat to you. We, that's the religious mindset. No, I've got to deal with this before I bring it to church, Pastor. I've got to deal with this before I bring it to the Lord. I've got to deal with, I've got to listen to, to, the, to all economists about how to fix my mess before I come to the Lord. No, he wants you to put him in the midst. And he shows up in the midst of their fear. And what does he do? He shows them his wounds right? Verse 19, the same day in the evening, the beginning of the first week when the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled in fear for the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst and he said to them, peace be with you. When he had 
said this, he showed them his hands and his side, right? Right? And this is him now showing them his peace, right? This peace is now yours. As you see, I have paid for it. I have died. Remember he said, I bequeath this to you. He shows up in the midst where they're in fear and trouble, and he says, now it becomes yours. Now it's real. Now, do you know what Jewish people call this peace all over Scripture? The word shalom. So we'll bring it up on the screen for you just before we close. Shalom, right? Now, in Hebrew, we read right to left. And in Hebrew, every letter has meanings, has pictures, and has numbers, right? And it's the most amazing thing. So you have shalom, right to left, right? You have a shin, a lamet, a vav, and a mem. So the shin is on the right, it looks like teeth, right? Then you have the lamet, which looks like a, like a, a, like a, like almost like a seven, like a stick. Then you have a vav, which is like even a smaller seven, which literally means nail. And then you have your mem, which actually means rushing, raging water. So shalom is made up of that, right? Shim, lamet, vav, mem, shalom, right? But do you know what each independent word means, right? Shin literally means teeth that destroy, okay? So that's why it looks, it looks like teeth anyways. Looks like a W, don't know, the rapping crowds on the old days, I don't know how, anyways, okay. But it's a shin, right? Then you have a lamet, which is literally means staff, like a shepherd's staff. It resembles leadership and authority. Then you have a vav, which is a nail, right, which means attached, which means to connect, right? And then you have a mem, which literally means like destructive flood waters. If you remember like recently now, we've had hectic floods in our nation down in, in Durban and around the world. It, it destroys everything in its path. So mem literally means destructive floods. Shalom, the peace that Jesus died to give you, literally means to destroy the authority attached to chaos. To destroy the authority connected to the chaos and the destruction around us. This peace takes back the authority over your life from the circumstance, from the destruction, from the situation, from the enemies set up and it repossesses it. That's why Jesus would stand up and say, be still. Because he was functioning from a higher authority, right? This is how God has designed for you to live through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit in these moments, in these days. Amen? His peace is your peace. Attached to that peace is rest. Literally, the root of rough of healing means relax. Relax. Chill. Be at rest. Let your heart be troubled for nothing. Your God is your provider. Your God is your leader. And your God is the payment for all your sin, your mistakes, your failures. It is not just that Jesus shows up and says, be at peace. He shows up and he says, everything that you've done wrong, all your sin, all your mistake, all your failures, look, I've paid for it. I have been the full payment through my hands, through my side. I've got this settled. I've got this handled. I've taken care of it for you. That's the peace that surpasses all understanding. Amen. I'm going to hand redemption back over to the pastors right Amen. now. Amen. Wasn't that just a powerful word? Just a powerful word. I want you just to say the word shalom. Say shalom to you. Peace to you. And we look to Jesus, the finished work, the finished work. I love that. He shows his hand and his side, 
and he says, peace be with you. And even today, we can look to Jesus and the finished work and receive his peace. I love the fact that Pastor Josh said in the beginning that we have a peace in our soul that's missing. And you might be here and you say, that resonated with me. I have a peace in my heart that is missing. And God made that. And the only person that fits that, that hole is Jesus. Jesus fits that hole. So today, if you haven't received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you're looking for peace, I want you to know that today, he says, here I am. You can receive him. You can receive him. You can see your, or receive your peace in Jesus' name. I'd like us all to close our eyes. I love what, what Pastor Josh said. It's the Holy Spirit that will come and talk to you and say, you need Jesus. You need Jesus. You don't need to be perfect. You need Jesus. You need his finished work. And today, if you're here in the house and you say, I want to receive Jesus, all I want you to do, and we're going to pray this prayer together with you, just say this after me. Say, Father God, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Today I acknowledge that I have sinned and I ask you to forgive me. Today I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And today I thank you that I am a child of God completely loved and completely forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, you are a new believer. Let's give them a hand clap. Welcome, welcome to the family and know that you are completely loved. We'd love to um, meet with you Outside that door, you'll be able to go to the New Believer Station. We have a little gift for you, which we'd love to share with you and pray with you. And um, just know that we want to walk a journey with you. And like Pastor Josh said, study the Word. Keep studying. Keep reading the Word. I made lots of notes, so, and I'm sure that you did too. And we can go back and listen to the message again. And share the word. Don't you think we should share this word? I think it was a word worth sharing. Amen. So let's partake in communion together. So I'm sure as you came in, you received your communion elements. If you didn't receive it, you can just raise your hand and one of our hosts will give you an element. I love partaking in communion because this points us to the finished work of the cross. This points us to Jesus. So if you want to stand or sit, you're more than welcome. And as we take, you can just take the, the first layer off and get the bread. I like to break the bread because it just reminds me that his body was broken so that we are made whole. So if you're standing with sickness in your body, as you break this, remember that by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. Top to toe, you were healed. And if you're standing and you're saying, well, I don't have finances, I'm really struggling financially. Jesus became poor, so you can be rich. As we partake, receive everything that he has paid in full for you already. Let's partake. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your finished work. Thank you. As you open the grape juice, this represents the blood, the precious blood of Jesus 
this blood that declares that you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, completely loved and completely forgiven. This is the seal of the promise. You are sealed, this blood over you in Jesus' name. Let's partake. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that as we have partaken, Lord, we see you in your fullness. We see you, Father, we thank you. Thank you for that finished work. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for watching today's word. I know you were blessed greatly and I wanna let you know if you want more resource like this, more sermons like this, they're all available for free on YouTube or on our Redemption Church app. So I wanna encourage you, if it blessed you, share this link with someone else and ensure that you get more of God's goodness and word in you. We are so excited that Redemption Church has been able to serve you with the good news of Jesus Christ today and look forward to seeing you return for more of God's goodness as we preach the word of Jesus. Be blessed.